Hi. Here we are. Welcome back to everyone's favorite book club, thinly disguised as a YouTube Let's Play channel. Book club. <laughs> uh, for this month, our we act this month. Our I I when I was sending out the service for this month, I told our patrons like, hey, yeah, and don't forget you could suggest you can suggest folks. Uh, and we haven't got we haven't played any IF on the channel in a while. Why don't y'all you know you know just nudging them gently to send us a, and a bunch of people send in a bunch of different uh, IF folks for us to take a look at games from which was absolutely delightful our patrons are the best <laughs> uh however that meant there was no like single winner from our patreon survey this month because like literally everyone picked something new <laughs> so we just picked one of the options that was sent in this month and we're gonna play photopia by adam cadre i believe this is our first foray into classic interactive fiction is it like the original I don't think we've played because we've played a lot of Twine games. I thought we'd done some M short stuff. Uh, we played. Um, oh, we played um, Galatea. And we played Galatea. Yeah. Um, I feel like this is. I feel like this is one of our like our very first ones where like we don't have the. I I don't know about you. I do. I did not grow up playing text adventures. I do not have the innate understanding in like vocabulary and technical knowledge for how to play these kinds of games. I understand Photopia is very beginner friendly, which is one of the reasons we picked it, and it's also very well regarded. Uh, so, th but this is going to be a learning experience for me. See, I very much did grow up with text adventures. They had, um, oh fuck, what was it? They had a number of those. Uh, text-based expl explorative DOS games on the yep. school computers when I was in elementary school. Was it like King's Quest or something? Oh, uh, like the Sierra type? Yeah, and you'd adventure around by typing the text prompts about yes. what, you should, what you wanted to do. And, mm -hmm. and it's part of that shared DNA. Because like, this is part of that shared DNA of like, what turn into a lot of games that like I come to enjoy. Like text-based adventures and uh, would have... And adventure games definitely had a lot of pollination with one another, and that would lead to the strand of visual novels in the style of Ace Attorney mm -hmm. down the line, uh, which are just adventure games. Um, and then after that, I um, I spent a lot of time getting into multiplayer online gaming way too early via multi-user oh, dungeons. Were you, I was going to say, were you mudding? You were in the I mud? was mudding. I was <laughs> mudding so That's much. That's fucking rad, though. See, I, I, I do wish I had more of that particular gaming experience growing up. I do regret not immersing myself with... with Because I was... I, when I was growing up and getting on the internet, I was on like the very back end of that time period mm -hmm. I feel to, to have that as your formative gaming experience uh it I was also I'll... weird for me already in the time frame because i'm only like what a year i are half only... a year older yeah, than you you're like so half a year older than it I was it was it was very much tail end for me it was weird that i was spending my mm -hmm. middle school years on telnet and but muds and cool. use net and all of that I stuff think the only like i i and the only like Think exposure as ever I ever had to mud was like Dan Shive did a sm short lived comic about his experiences play in muds at mm. one point and um isn't user the comic I think so yeah 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 that takes that that's uh but a lot of like that culture would then develop into like the MMORPG stuff where or not just MMORPG but like MMO stuff mm -hmm. that we have Anyway, I'm spending a whole lot of time justifying our decision to play this on the channel. When yeah. I don't think it needs to be. This sounds like fun and I'm going to have a great time. And you all are going to shut up and just be nice while I fumble I'm through I'm not going to shut up. I've got a microphone. I'm supposed to talk. You are supposed to talk. That is true. <laughs> um, how This game does appear to be very beginner friendly. Uh, and I have Vivian here to help me help steer me should I need it. Um, we've got our Glulks installed. We've loaded up our Blorb. I, I will say, half of these words sound made, like, not just made up, but, like, half of these words sound like things that would go around Tumblr <laughs> in 20 years in the future. <laughs> so, prescience is what you're saying. Yeah. Regardless. 
Photopia. This is Photopia version 2.01. Uh, for those of you that care about that, I think the uh, the author describes the only difference was that it had the the wrapping hmm. that we have here, uh, as far as according to the website that we got it off of. But um, hopefully, that in case that matters, there's that. Photopia 2.01 was written in G Lulks Inform Glulks Inform for the Wing Lulks interpreter. I'm gonna be. <laughs> None of these words are in the Bible. <laughs> Glulks is by Andrew Plotkin, uh, who was also on our Patreon survey this month. <laughs> yep. Oh, you guys are the best, by the way. Inform is by Graham Nelson. Wing Luck Lulks is by David Kinder. Credit is also due to the entire IF community for all its feedback since the original release of Photopia in 1998. If Photopia does not respond to your input, click inside the window where the text is. Would you like instructions? I think you would. I would like instructions. Okay, so I finished reading the opening paragraphs. What am I supposed to do with this angle bracket thingy? Good question. The angle bracket prompt appears whenever it is your turn to tell the game what you want to do. Simply type in an imperative statement like open the door or eat the sandwich and press the enter key. Also, articles aren't necessary. Open door or eat sandwich will work just as well. Occasionally, the game will ask you to clarify a command you've typed. For instance, if you type eat sandwich and there's more than one sandwich in your... Oh, I see. Okay. And there's more than one sandwich in your immediate vicinity. The game may respond. Which sandwich do you mean? The ham sandwich or the bologna sam- bologna sandwich? Do you say bologna or bologna? Bologna. Fair. Which is, is confusing. I know, right? It is not usually necessary to retype your command. Simply answering the question is fine. Ham is a sufficient reply, for example. Of course, you don't have to answer the question if you don't want to. If you're a vegetarian and don't want to eat either sandwich, you can type open door and the game will treat it as an all new command. No matter how enthralling your initial location is, chances are you'll eventually want to go somewhere else. To do so, simply type the direction you want to go. Walk north is perfectly acceptable. Command, but N will do the same thing, and is much easier to type. If you are not carrying a compass, you can still navigate commands such as enter kitchen or exit. Interesting. Should I have pen and paper to make a map? I don't know. I think we should give it a go and see what happens. Yeah. Sometimes you will encounter people and other animate creatures to whom, with whom you'll wish to converse. In Photopia, the verbs ask and tell have been replaced with the command talk to. For example, talk to the pirate. Even such commands as yes and no are subsumed under the aegis of talk to. Talk to is your friend. All right, so walk, cardinal direction, talk to, and then simple... Yeah. <laughs> We spent years trying to get AI a dungeon to do this for us. <laughs> oh, man. Like most interactive fiction these days, Photopia has a reasonably impressive vocabulary. Some words you might want to try are buy, close, drink, drop, eat, examine, give, jump, kill, kiss, knock, lick, listen, look, open, pull, push, put, read, remove, search, show, sit, sleep, smell, taste, throw, tie, touch, turn, untie, and wear. You can also combine many of these verbs with prepositions. In addition to look, you can look at, look inside, look under, look through, and so forth. Okay, simple verbs, simple verbs with prepositions can also work. I assume that through context, we'll have an idea of what we want to do. Mm -hmm. There are also a number of special commands and abbreviations you should be aware of. In addition to the compass directions mentioned above, they include G is short for again. This repeats the last command. Okay. I is short for inventory. This produces a list of what you're carrying. You know what? I am going to write these down. Hold on. Talk to him for a second while I grab the notebook. Hello. How is your Wednesday? I hope you're watching this on Wednesday. Otherwise, this interlude makes no sense. <laughs> we haven't uploaded on Wednesdays in a while. You know this. Are our videos only available on upload day? There is a chance. Yes. I go through and I uh, unlist them on <laughs> off days of the week. I'm, I'm like your mom turning off the router when it gets too late at night. <laughs> All right. I got the... Uh, we had to get a new notebook for uh, channel stuff here. So I'm just going to take down these 
shorthand ones here, so I know which ones to use. Uh, so there's the... G. G means... Again. Again. Which starts Simple with the letter enough. Which, do, which does start with G. I is for inventory. Cool, cool, cool. L is for look. And X is for examine. Okay. Excellent. Oh, Z is short for wait, causes a turn to pass without an action being performed. Okay. I like how they say Z is short for wait. Uh huh. <laughs> sure it is. And then quit to end the game. Yep. Quit, restart, restore, save. Yeah, okay, that don't make sense. Door and now here's my question. Yeah, is this gonna be like? Do you do you imagine this to be that this might be like a Sierra type experience where we'll want to save frequently, save often, and the game will screw us over? It's unclear. Yeah, I don't know. Well, I think we'll give it a go raw first and see what happens. And if we find we we need to be more judicious with our saving, we'll do so. The main rule of thumb here is to keep your commands as simple as you can while still getting the meaning of cross. The parser has come a long way from when two words were the maximum allowed. You can enter commands such as give the banana to the Rhesus monkey, the Rhesus monkey, then take all from the cage except the banana peel, and be understood perfectly. But the parser will not understand things like walk up to the sign or go back to where I was a few minutes ago. Once you get the hang of it, the correct way to enter commands becomes second nature. So feel your way around, try things as they occur to you, and most of all, have fun. We will! Thank you, Adam. Will you read me a story? Read you a story? What fun would that be? I've got a better idea. Let's tell a story together. Oh, all right. Yeah, sure. We love stories about telling stories here. <laughs> that is like our somehow our bread and butter. Speeding down Montgomery Boulevard. The street lights are bright, unbearably bright. You have to squint as hard as you can to keep your retinas from bursting into flame. Welcome back to the land of the living, bud, Rob says. Are you planning to stick around for a while, or are you going to pass out again? Cause one thing I learned about chicks is they actually don't like it when you pass out on them in the middle of getting it on. You hear me? So if that's, like, your plan, then I'm dropping you off and showing up solo. You don't exactly remember where the day went, but as you listen to Rob rant on, bits of it start to float back to you. A day on the slopes, the brisk February wind against your face, polishing off a keg back at the lodge. Those two girls you and Rob had hit it off with. The ones who'd given you their addresses in town. We all should get together sometime, they'd said. Of course, Rob insisted that by sometime they'd meant later tonight. You hadn't been so sure, but then you'd blacked out before you could argue the point. How Rob came to be driving your car, you're not exactly sure. Apparently, he couldn't wait to tell you were sober enough to drive it yourself. From the way he's weaving all over the road, he also apparently couldn't wait until he was sober enough to drive it either. Rob looks over his shoulder as if about to change lanes, but then turns on the windshield wipers instead of the turn signal. Oops, he says. Interesting. Okay. So, our... So, okay, we met... We met some we met some girls at the lodge. Mm -hmm. Our friend Rob is driving us around, and dr Rob does not seem to does also not seem to fit to be behind the wheel right now. There were some things up there. Can, can I scroll back up? I can't scroll back up. Interesting. Once you're done, you're done. Okay. Um. Let's just take a. Why don't we just try the basic here? Let's take a look. Yeah, let's look. I'm gonna turn on caps lock so it looks right. You're in your car, which nor wouldn't normally be all that remarkable, except this time you're in the passenger seat. You're practically never in the passenger seat of your own car. You're also not in the back seat nearly as often as you'd like. 
Rob checks himself out in the rearview mirror. Man, I am one handsome dude, he says approvingly. Rob looks at the scrap of paper with the address on it as the two of you go screaming through an empty intersection. Aw, oh, man. It's a fake address. They gave us a... No. Wait, it's upside down. He turns the paper right side up. Oh, hey, they're right on Bartlett Hill Road. Sweet. Uh, Shaq. <laughs> Rob, can we get you to pull over, man? <laughs> we, we could say ask Rob to pull over. Try it. Uh, should I say... Try it. Ask Rob to pull over? Yeah, try it. See what happens. Okay. Okay, yeah, that's that's too much. Okay. I was going to say, can we talk Rob or something? Yeah. No. Okay. Just talk to Rob work. There we go. There we go. Okay. Please select one. Ask Rob about blood alcohol level. Ask Rob about those chicks. You idiot. Pull over. <laughs> I, I, I mean... <laughs> I think the game read our mind of what we would like to do here. Yeah. Which is, uh, you idiot. Pull over. The only reason I'd pull the car over is to let you out and keep on going, dude. You look up. Uh, do you want me to be you? sure uh hey it's red you say oh what rob says the light you say you know red as in stop but you don't stop you don't even slow down as you fly into the intersection and the light stays an unmistakable red red interesting interesting You are Wendy Mackay, first girl on the Red Planet. When you signed up for this mission, you thought that you were going to be coming, uh, you would be, <laughs> you thought that you were going to be coming to a habitable colony. Habitable means that you can live there. See, the orbiter was supposed to drop all the pieces of the colony, the power plant, the living quarters, the greenhouse, things like that, onto the planet's surface, packed in airbags which would bounce around and then open up once they were safely on the ground. Some of the airbags were supposed to hold big trucks, which could be operated by remote control. Dragging the pieces of the colonies into their proper places, your job was going to be to take a tour of the place and verify that everything was up and running. Verify means to make sure. Instead, something went wrong on the orbiter, and it blew up before it had a chance to drop off its payload. Pieces of the orbiter and the colony rained all over the landscape, so this has become a salvage mission. Your instruments indicate that there is at least one piece that's still functioning. Functioning means it's not broken. Your job is to find that piece, or pieces if there's more than one. Do you climb down the ladder of your ship and step onto the surface of an alien world? Landing site. You are standing at the base of your ship. The onboard computers selected this general area as the most likely place to find salvageable remains of what would have been the colony. Salvageable means you can save it. The battered, rust-red landscape stretches out before you in every direction, pitted and pockmarked and littered with boulders. A ladder leads up to the hatch of your ship. Um, Let's, let's take a look at our surroundings first before we do anything else. Yeah. I want to get a vibe for what we're... Okay, right, okay, just okay. the same thing. Okay, okay. Just, I wondered. Sometimes it's narrative, and then sometimes it's it's like this is the. Let's examine the ship. Yeah, let's do that. What kind of ship is it? Can I just do X ship? This is your trusty spaceship, which you recently renamed from the Space Pony to the Aspiration. A wise choice, if I may say so. So this is interesting. Is that there's both a U and an I <laughs> in this? I don't know if that's just like the the author being a little bit funny, but like. We've played too many games where, like, where <laughs> the idea of narrative interlocking with yeah. yeah, right, right, where there's both the narrative, the narrative about the narrative, and the two, and the relationship between the two. Uh, it could just be a throwaway gag, but it's funny. Uh, at least we don't have to mark Watney our way out of this, <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, we apparently have gotten everything we need. Um, let's look at the landscape or, or the boulders. Yeah, let's go ahead and look boulders. Uh, How about landscape? Okay, fair enough. Um, Do we have anything in our inventory? Let's check that. We 
We didn't even try. You are carrying nothing. You are wearing your spacesuit. Fair enough. Uh, do we want to... Oh, let's look at... Hold on. <laughs> oh, oh, it won't... It probably wants me to just type ship instead of the name of it. Yeah. Even though it's asper... Oh, pfft. Shpi. Uh, listen, I didn't realize I was going to get gated by my terrible typing today. Interesting. So is look not like this? Do we have to examine in order to look at a specific object? Or what if we say look at ship? Oh, let me try that. Yes, we're missing. Okay, okay we're missing the the, the uh, at. Yeah, so let's okay. look at the landscape or at the boulders. I will do that. All right. Uh, let's do look at boulders. Some of, oh, there we go. Some of the rocks are as small as pebbles. Others are the size of dog houses. All are the same deep red color as the rest of the planet. It doesn't say Mars, which Let's is... Let's think about Mars. Can we think about things? Sure. I don't have a hotkey for that. That's fine. Okay, that's that not a verb you need to use. Okay. Um, let's... Can we look north? Okay. Fair enough. Try actually typing out north, though, because N is probably a shortcut for the verb. Okay. Well, look at north. You see nothing special about the north. Okay, so we don't so see So we any can. Okay, cool. Okay. Let's see if there's anything... Nothing special to the east. Nothing special all around us. Okay, so no particular direction calling to us. Um, let's just go south. Yeah. Pick a direction and walk it. You take a few steps to the south, amazed at how the light gravity turns each step into a great bounding leap near the huge tread. You are standing next to what seems to be a piece of bulldozer or some other sort of construction equipment. Hold on, I am going to make a map of this. <laughs> if you want, when we're done, I'll, sh I'll show off the notebook from this as well. You are standing next to what seems to be a piece of bulldozer or some other sort of construction equipment. It is a set of wheels, each one bigger across than you are tall, wrapped in a tread like on an army tank. You can tell it landed with some force from the ring of debris that surrounds it in a perfect circle. Uh, can we exam Let's examine the tread. Yeah. The tread is not only taller than you are, but the closest handholds and footholds are out of your reach. How about the wheel? Wheels. Okay, same thing. Um... What about the debris? The impact of the tread sprayed a circle of rust red dirt around the point where it landed. Just like the ripple around a rock thrown into a pond. Eat the dirt? <laughs> Nothing like that seems to be around. Okay, good. <laughs> but we know that eat is valid. Also, we're in a space suit. How would we eat? Stop this. <laughs> Think about this for a moment. Um, I don't know that there's much we can... This doesn't look salvageable, does it? Not really. Is there, we've examined it in close handholds. Or, it implies we want to climb it. Because it mentions handholds. Interesting. Okay. Well, I don't know that there's much we can do here. Yeah. This doesn't say... Um, uh, do we want to go back north and try a different direction from there, or just... Let's keep going south. Keep going south? All right. Among the ruins of the living quarters. What? Okay. They had quarters that were alive? Stop. Do you do this on purpose? <laughs> is this is this fun to you? Kind of messed up using a living being as a 25 cent piece of currency. I like how you under misunderstood both words in that. <laughs> As you walk, you find first one geodesic panel, then another. When people make a dome out of simple polygons like triangles or hexagons, that's called geodesic. What What do you think is the the importance of us continually having reminders about 
so, such and such means so and so. Yeah. What do you think is that uh, the importance of that is? I don't know. Like, are is, is it the case where we are constant? Like, are we as this character look, constantly looking things up because we don't understand the words, or is it a is is there some other relationship here that we're? It's just an interesting uh, literary flourish, and I'm just wondering what I'm supposed to be taking from it. Yeah, I don't know yet. Soon, the clear plastic panels are as plentiful as the rust-red boulders. This must be where the dome for the living quarters landed. Soon, then, you find that you're right. Scattered around you are the remains of what would have been home to the first wave of colonists. Most of the housing units have been reduced to unidentifiable splintered heaps, but there is at least one that seems to be intact. Intact means, uh, that it isn't so damaged that it's unusable. The entrance is partially obscured. Obstructed. Obstructed means blocked by debris, but you're small enough that you could probably squeeze through. That's part of what makes you the perfect person for this job, aside from your astronautical expertise. Astronautical doesn't really may mean anything, I just made it up. <laughs> Alright, time to go in an entrance, I suppose. Are we a child? Maybe. Is that why we're having words explained to us? Is that why our small frame is so important? We are a child? Maybe, let's... let's uh... <laughs> Can we look at ourself? Let's do that real quick. It'll be at. Oh, right. You hardly need to be reminded what you look like, Wendy. Even if you didn't see yourself in the mirror every morning, the countless newspaper pictures and magazine covers would remind you. Interesting. 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 Oh. Interesting. Okay. So we're famous. We're famous, but are we famous as in like... Are we famous in, in in the Neil Armstrong sense, or are we famous in the Greta Thunberg sense? I don't understand what you're trying <laughs> like, to get across by this. <laughs> uh, anyway, let's, let's look see. at the entrance. Yeah, let's look at entrance. At and. I am typing with one hand now. Oh, which you could tell because I keep typoing. Okay. Can we crawl through debris? Uh, how about like that? It's not a verb you need to use. Let's look again. What does it describe it as? Housing unit. Small enough to squeeze through entrance. Can we, like, go entrance or something? Try door? Or housing unit? or Yeah, let's go housing unit. Yeah! Okay, okay, okay. Alright, so... Then from here... Inside the housing unit. Since no one ever moved into this unit, it's really nothing but an empty gray box. No bigger than your bedroom back home. These quarters weren't designed with anything but sleeping in mind. The first colonists were expected to make take their meals in a central dining commons, and bathrooms were to be in a separate structure, with each one shared by a number of people. Still, you can't help but feel a twinge. This was going to be someone's home. The first thing they saw when they woke up, the place where they looked forward to retreating after a hard day doing research or exploring the planet's surface or helping to maintain the colony. Uh, where I, I have trouble. Third oh, there were yeah, there it is. That didn't go far. There were going to be pictures on these walls, footprints on the floor. Now the only footprints left here will be yours. Right, okay. Um, I don't know if there's anything to do in here then. Yeah. Because there's nothing, it's nothing but a gray box. No bigger than your bedroom. Can we type look for salvage? All right. Okay. Um, let's see. We looked uh we looked around here. Can we 
Nothing like that seems to be one. Okay. Fair enough. Oh, uh, I guess this is not, there's not much left in here. Judging from the description of it. And there doesn't seem to be anything in the description mentioning like an object in here we could interact with or something. Yeah. So let's go ahead and... Can we go back? Would go back work? Maybe. Let's try go outside. Or leave housing unit? <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. Oh, just leave. Okay. Straight up. Okay. Um. Well, nothing interesting there. We've gone south two more twice. Do we want to keep going south? Yeah. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. Th there is a lot out here. Okay. Now, the here is the power plant. Among the ruins of the power plant. The power plant is in substantially worse shape than the living quarters, considering that those were completely wrecked. That's saying something. Though the fissionable materials were especially, or especially packaged to prevent them from exploding, the Geiger counter in your suit indicates this area is still very radioactive. I'll explain that part later. For now, let's just say it was very dangerous and you should probably be moving along. Oh, right, because this is two people telling a story, right? Oh. Right? So, this is... Is this... Is this... Yeah, this is two people telling a story. Hmm. So... Maybe maybe it's not that the character is a child, but maybe the person that the the second party, the you, as is. the person telling the story, is a child. Yeah, that could be. Then maybe that's what it is. It's, it's very dangerous. You should probably be moving along. Okay. So the power plant ruins. Radioactive. So we shouldn't be staying here. We shouldn't be hanging around here, according to this, huh? Yeah. So naturally, we'll wait. <laughs> I'm not. Do you want me to wait? No. Okay. Uh, do you want me to... Um... Didn't give a clear... No, no didn't okay. give a clear mention of any noun to look at. Yeah. Fair enough. I've just taken a shot in the dark. I, 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 judging from the earlier stuff, it seems to be, like, a standard thing to, like, if there's something meant for you to look at, it'll be brought up specifically in the narration, right? The, narra the narration is not just prose for, you know, describing things in such a way. It is also a mechanical thing keying you in on what is important and what to look around at. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting... As someone who is writing their own novel right now, that is a fascinating angle on the use of language. Let's keep looking then. Do we want to head south? Might as well, right? Yeah. And if it ain't broke... Okay. Interesting. Can we climb the bulldozer? Near the wrecked bulldozer. You're standing near what appears to be most of a bulldozer. Maybe the one that the tread you saw used to be attached to. Aside from that, this area is fairly desolate. Though cars and even trucks have become more sleek and streamlined with each passing year, bulldozers haven't changed a bit. This one is just as big and chunky as any of you ever seen. It is missing a tread and is leading over far enough that you wouldn't have much trouble squeezing inside. Let's do it. As you attempt to climb up into the bulldozer, the remaining tread gives way, and the cab of the bulldozer comes crashing down on top of you. Only your lightning quick reflexes save you from being crushed and killed. Okay. Well, let's look around. Oh, we're st oh, we didn't st we still didn't. Is it safe to try again? Let me let let's me try. try it. Yeah, because like there's an again command for a reason, right? Oh no, you're not going to try that again. Okay. <laughs> All right, fine. Fair enough. Uh, you know what? Fair point. Uh, I guess let's head south. Let's yeah. just keep looking around. And the clicking in your helmet grows steadily louder. You must be getting closer to what you're looking for. Soon you find yourself. Oh, it gets louder in this direction. 
Uh oh. Wait, the clicking in our helmet gets louder? Yeah. That's not good. That's the Geiger counter. Yeah. <laughs> but it must be what we're looking for. Oh. I see. Among the ruins of the greenhouse, the colonization plants called for a central dome where plants designed to thrive in the harsh, lifeless soil of the red planet would be grown and used for food. Like potatoes. What? Sorry, I had another Martian joke. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> How did you forget Martian? about potatoes? Everywhere you look are broken containers that once held seed pods and now contain nothing but cinders and ash. Among the shattered seed pod containers, you see one single undamaged one. Hmm. Yep. The moment you touch the seed pod container, the clicking in your helmet stops. This is the only item you will be able to save. Interesting. The moment you touch the seed pod container, the that's Can we examine the container? The seed pod container is a red globe about the size of a cantaloupe, which is designed to withstand an awful lot of damage but can be opened with a simple twist. Hmm. Do we want to try it? No, cuz if we open it then that's I don't know what happens we try it. Try it. You open the seed pod container, revealing a seed pod. Taken. Can we examine the pod? The seed pod, designed for rapid growth and even in a hostile environment, looks sort of like a cross between a pine cone and a small pineapple. Hmm. Huh. Can we plant the pod? You don't have any digging equipment. Got it. So we need to find digging equipment if we want to plant this pod. We didn't. I don't think we saw anything like a shoveler. We found like a, big, yeah. a lot of big construction equipment because there's the tread, the living quarters, the power plant, the bulldozer, and the green. Okay. Is there anything else around us at the moment? No. Okay. Let's head south. Yeah. The shallow crater. Yes, I am still making a map just in case this matters. <laughs> I'm remembering the uh, the first bit of um, C++, mm. which definitely, definitely would have been easier if I had d given up and made a map sooner. <laughs> you know what I mean? <sighs> In the shallow crater. Every remnant of the colony you've encountered so far has left a depression. Remnant means a remaining piece. Depression means a sort of bowl-shaped hole in the ground. It can also mean being really, really sad, but that's a different kind of depression. But this crater wasn't caused by any of the debris from the explosion. This crater is ancient and huge. The meteorite that caused it was maybe a kilometer across. It's also shallow for its size, meaning that it was some sort of erosion has been at work. Maybe this planet once held water and life, but it doesn't anymore. Huh. That's really... <laughs> this is, like, when you step back and think of... The, this is a really melancholy scene, isn't it? Just kind of like the lone person striding among the failed first... The, the catastrophically failed first attempt at colonizing Mars. Yeah. And just being like, what can I save here? A single seed pod? <laughs> Dang. Um... Dang. I don't know that there's much else we can do. This would be a nice place to plant it if we had digging tools, but we haven't found a shovel or anything. Yeah. So I guess we gotta go south. So let, yeah, I guess we gotta go south. Much as you much like to go exploring, now that you found what you're looking for, you really should get back to the ship. Your spacesuit has a limited supply of power. Not oh, so we came here just for the just for the seed pod. Okay, I guess. so that's it, or that's far south as we can go. Can we go other directions? Let's try it. Got it. Okay. 
Greenhouse. I am going to just... Yeah, okay. Okay. W like, what if, though, right? Need the wreck bulldozer. Can we find shovel? <laughs> Can I take shovel? <laughs> I want to take the stick. I feel like that seems to be it was worth a shot, alright. And now we're at the power plant. Okay, let's just keep going. We don't want to go stay around here. The living quarters. Surprised that they survived. <sighs> the second time you've done this. What is it that do you derive pleasure from this? Yes. I see. Can we can we go tread? Don't tread on me. That's not something you're gonna do. It was worth a <laughs> shot. Back in the landing site. Uh can we go other direction? Will you let me go east now? Seems to have given us a really clear answer about what we do. But I <laughs> can you Alright, fine. Let's go to ship. Gently placing the seed pod on the seat next to you, you rock it back into space, leaving the red planet in your wake. Soon a familiar cloud streaked blue ball appears on your monitors. You are home again at last. Man, that Epstein drive is really working. Uh, that that's what they're called in the um, in the um, Leviathan Wakes books, right? Mm, I do not remember at all. Oh man! But something goes terribly wrong. The heat shields hold up fine during reentry, but the parachutes fail to open as you head for splashdown, and so you plummet at an incredible rate. The ocean growing closer and closer. You hear a splash. Oh. Let's look around. In your home office. When you and Sam put that down payment on this house five years ago, you were expecting that you were going to need all four bedrooms eventually. But after the complications with Allison, you found yourself with a couple of extras on your hands. This one came in very handy when you started telecommuting. You can't say you're exactly glad that this room became an office instead of a bedroom for a brother or sister of Allie's, but... You are glad that you and Sam decided not to move into that smaller house you were considering. Interesting. So, home so, office, dead kid. Huh? Home office, dead kid. Rough time. Dead kid? It just says complications. What complication would cause you to have an extra room after you calculated the number of rooms you need? So, the way I'm reading this was that this was aspirational for them. They wanted to have more kids. But something about having Allison... Oh, Allie is Allison. Sorry. Okay, yes, you're right. <laughs> yeah, that. so I read it as, like, they did have a child, but there were complications or that made, like, it not a good decision to have more. I hadn't processed that Allie was meant Allison, for, yeah. and so I thought it was like, oh, there were complications with Allison, and now there is only Allie. There were meant to be four people, and now there are only three. Oh, I see. Yeah, that would be a much more... No, I'm pretty sure Allie yeah. is just for, Yeah. And she will inevitably get the nickname Alley Cat, and she will hate it, but it, it's just an inevitability. Huh. Okay. If this is the same person that No, because we, the Sam, Sam is gender neutral. I can't really tell if we're meant to be, who we're meant to be in this relation. Are we, are we Allie's mother or Allie's father? It's unclear. We'll see. Your computer screen is, as usual, cluttered with the details of the Peterson account. Let's look at the, the computer. fucking Peterson account. Am I, we, like, we, we've, we've had this issue for years with that. <laughs> I also like the novelty of telecommuting. Because this came out in, what, 1998? Yeah. Before we all collectively decided that, wait, no, actually, forcing people to go into work sucks. And then decided that, okay, and we're going to do it anyway. Yeah, exa exactly. I, the idea, telecommuting being a word is... it. it right, you're very right. The existence of it being a word. 
it, it, as rather than being work from home, so many Dilbert comics spilled over this concept, and it's like, no, it's just working from home, man. It's it's such a different. It has such a different valence now than it did twenty five years ago. Mm hmm. Uh, can we look Peterson account? It would have to be an at. Right. Let me. It's been weeks, but you and your co-workers down at the office finally seem to have the Peterson account wrapped up. You wonder whether you might be able to nip down to the office for the party they're sure to have once the account is finally sent off. Can we examine the computer? Yeah, let's take a look at the computer. That's oh shit, the splash! Right, I completely forgot about it. It's been weeks, but you and your co-workers down in the office finally see- Oh, right, 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 okay. Can now, you can only hear the whir of your computer, but you would have swore you, swore you heard a splash just a couple seconds ago. Um... You're standing in the hallway just outside your office. Your guest Gabriel's your guest Gabriel's room lies just ahead of you. The door wide open. A flight of stairs leads down to the ground floor. Um let's go to the room. Oh. Managed to get good use out of the fourth bedroom as well, taking in an exchange student through the Tertalia World Youth Program. In exchange for you providing Gabriel with room and board, Allison is entitled to spend a year attending school and living with Gabriel's family in Paraguay when she's 18, should she choose to go. Whether Allie will have any inclination to visit Paraguay in 14 years is still an open question. You walk up to the window and take a look outside and feel a bayonet slice through your heart. Gabriel is fishing Allie out of the pool. It takes all the willpower you possess to take the stairs merely at five at a time instead of simply throwing yourself down the staircase. In the backyard. Your backyard isn't exactly sprawling, but it was more than big enough to accommodate the small swimming pool which Allison was never supposed to be allowed near, at least not until she learned how to swim. As you throw open the sliding glass door, Gabriel gently lays Allie down on the cement bank of the pool. Have you called the emergency, he asks. No, I will call, he runs, dripping wet back into the house. Gabriel comes dashing back outside, telephone in hand. The ambulances are coming, and at the same time, I have the instructions for the CPR, he declares. First, you must tilt her head back. All right, let's do that. You tilt her head back. Good, Gabriel says. Now you must breathe into her mouth. You breathe into Allie's mouth. Good, Gabriel says. Now you must press her chest. Oh. You apply pressure to Allie's chest and suddenly see she cops up a mouthful of water. A minute later, she's sitting up and looking around bewilderedly. Allison, you cry. Oh, you should be. Allison, baby, how many times have we told you not to go near the pool? Another minute and we would have lost you. You know you're not supposed to go near... I wanted to see, she says. What? You say. I wanted to see, she says. The world looked the same under the water as it does over it. Hmm. Sea blue. Photo. Oh, right. I almost reread the name of the game. <laughs> Your spaceship was able to survive the impact with the ocean easily. You barely even felt the jolt. Impact is what it's called when things smack into one another. There wasn't even any damage unless you count the flotation devices bursting. But you should definitely count that. Because without your floats, your ship sinks like a stone down, down, down into the murky depths. You're still not worried, since you can always just fly the ship right back up to the surface. Except when you hit that when you hit the bottom, the engines go dead. You try to restart them with no success. Interesting. And also, spaceships are designed to work from a uh, from a pressure of zero to one atmospheres. <laughs> Famously not as good with lower, with higher pressures.
Oh, shoot. I, I missed a part there. I'm so sorry. No. You try to restart the engines with no success. Fortunately, your spacesuit is watertight and more than capable of protecting you from the water pressure sh that would otherwise crush you like a soda can. It will have to. You're going to have to swim for it. You gather up your sp seed... <laughs> oh, don't get the bends. You gather up your seed pod, head to the airlock, turn on the lights in your suit, and hope for the best. Airlock. Well, this is a first. You're standing on the door of the airlock. Usually you're firmly rooted to the floor and the door is just as firmly set in the wall, or else you're floating weightlessly and there... Uh, is no real up or down, but the ship landed at an odd angle, and you're not quite sure what to expect when you open the doors. If there isn't enough room for you to crawl up between the door and the ocean bottom, you're in some serious trouble. The wall, or now floor, is festooned with a big blue button, which opens the door. Festooned means adorned. Huh? Oh, adorned means decorated. I guess we gotta push the button. Yeah, I guess we push the button, huh? Because it seems like we're ready to go. I think the big thing is, like, will the door open if there's so much pressure on the other side, right? Well, let's see what happens. Also, I'm wondering how many of these stories that are being shared are somewhat metaphorically or allegorically related to Allie's life here. Maybe. The idea of, like, because the idea of almost drowning turning into this fear of needing to get up from the bottom of the sea, right? Hmm. And this looking at the uh, well, it could just be you know finding patterns where there aren't let's see what else. you've had a couple of experiences with explosive decompression where you had to open up the airlock door and the rush of escaping air blows you out into space what happens when you fly in a 747 <laughs> this time the rush of water flying into the airlock smashes you up into the ceiling or at least now it's the ceiling it used to be the back wall luckily your suit is able to cushion the blow so the airlock is full of water, and you are able to swim out the door, which closes behind you. In the Great Hall. At first, you're confused. You expected the ocean bottom to be centimeters from the open door. Instead, you drift down, down, ever down. And when your feet do finally touch something solid, it isn't the silt of the bottom of the sea, but a stone floor. You look up, hoping to see a glimmer of the surface. Instead, you find a stone ceiling far too high above your head to reach, and right where you might expect to find a chandelier, you see the blinking blue lights around the outside of your ship's airlock through the hole it made upon impact. You've crashed into an undersea castle. Well, that's cool. Moldy stone walls stand all around you, dimly visible through the murk. You feel them more than see them. Chunks of fallen stone from the ceiling lie scattered about at your feet. You can barely make out arched doorways leading north and south. Also at your feet is the seed pod. You lost track of it in the rush of water. You scoop it up. That is... Feel the more than... Oh. Okay. So... Oh! Yeah, the door is north and south. Yep. Okay. Um... Well, South hasn't failed us so far. South hasn't failed us so far. I am going to make another map. Just in case. Really, I just played Etrian Odyssey once, and now I just have to make maps every single time. <laughs> That's all this is. In the keep. You are standing in the keep, a fortified tower inside the castle walls. Fortified means strengthened. A stone spiral staircase leads upward, but stops abruptly when it reaches the ceiling. Okay. Let's climb the stairs. Hmm. Oh, I guess, I guess like they they don't go anywhere, so we can't. That's fair. Maybe we can examine the stairs? Let me try that. Okay. Stone spiral reads... Maybe... Staircase. Staircase? The stairs are slippery with mold, but are otherwise solid. Okay, okay let's fair. climb the staircase. Let's try that. That doesn't accomplish anything. Okay. Fair enough. That's fine. 
Uh, I guess we just go back north then. Doesn't yeah. seem like there's much else to do here. Okay, so if we head north, what do we find? Dining hall. This is a great empty chamber, just like the one you landed in. Except for a long stone slab that you decide must be a dining table. You don't have any evidence for this. You don't know how this castle got here or who might have lived in it. For all you know, they might have been incredibly tall, skinny, water-breathing creatures. And this was one of their beds. But for the time being, we'll call it a dining table. Exits once again lead north and south. Check out that table a little more. Oh. You gotta tell me when I'm uh, typoing. <laughs> it's several meters long, but only about a meter wide. People sitting at the ends of the table would need to scream to hear each other, assuming they had some way of hearing each other underwater at all. Water actually conducts sound better than air. It's the change from air in your throat to water, and then from the water in your ears that makes it sound too muffled to understand. Just so you know. Interesting. All right, well, let's keep going north. The throne room. Uh, X wolves. <sighs> I've been led to believe that they are in there. Th that's where their natural location is. No, I yeah. understand you. I understand you perfectly. This room is just as big as the others you've seen, but unlike the others, this one contains a barnacle encrusted object in the unmistakable shape of a chair. Given the place you found it and the fact that it is built into the floor, you can only conclude that it must be a throne. The far wall features a carved out alcove that looks like it must have been a fireplace. Though how one might go about lighting a fire underwater is anyone's guess. Mounted on the wall above the fireplace in an X shape are a pickaxe and shovel. I would like both of those, please. Oh, let's grab those. You missed the tea. Thank you. Because there was more text. Oh! An arched doorway leads east, but it's completely blocked by debris. You can also go back the way you came. Maybe we can get through that debris with the, uh... Yeah. The pickaxe clings firmly to the wall. You tug on it again, and this time the handle moves a few centimeters. Then you feel a distinct click. The castle begins to rumble with the shake, the shaking most pronounced in the direction of the keep. The shovel, which was wedged behind the pickaxe, clatters to the ground, and the rumbling stops. After that, the pickaxe swings back into place. Shovel, shovel, shovel. So we can't take the pickaxe, but we can take the shovel? Taken. Oh, it was a lever. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's try to go east. Uh, oh, was well, there anything else in here before we go east? Because there was a couple of... There was the fireplace, right? Oh, yeah. We can examine stuff. And the throne. And the throne itself. If not for the perfect edges, you'd think this was nothing more than a hole in the wall. And we... I wonder if we can go through that. Let me take a look at the throne first. Either no one has sat on this throne for a long time, or the monarch in question didn't mind sitting on several layers of barnacles. Barnacles are... Oh, you know already? Great! You sit on the throne and enjoy your moment as the queen of all you survey. Unfortunately, all you survey is, isn't really a whole lot. You decide being an astronaut is better than being a queen and hop off the throne. <laughs> true. True. Astronauts are the real heroes. Uh, can we go into the fireplace? Because is there like a flu or something? I or hope a... it doesn't have the flu. No, because the, uh, the, the flu is the thing that goes in front of it. It's the, it's the shoot we want to. Well, you could probably squeeze inside without your spacesuit. The fireplace is just a bit too small for you to enter right now. All right. I don't want the fireplace to give me the flu or shoot me. Uh, can we <laughs> shovel debris? I, I'm, I'm just not engaging with this anymore. <laughs> okay, not a verb you need to use. Try Fair. dig. Huh? Oh, dig. Yeah, that might be it. I will once I've had a sip of my coffee. Difficult to do underwater, especially through stone. Guess not. Fair enough. I guess we can't go east. Um, well, the keep was rumbling, and that was the other way, so maybe the stairway goes somewhere Yeah, now. I guess we'll go south. 
Let's see. Nothing seems new here. Try south again. Oh. Leads upward to the ocean's surface. Interesting. So pulling the lever is... Okay, cool. Um... Approaching the surface. You start up the stairs, the murk gradually diminishing as you come closer and closer to the surface. But just as the sun starts to resolve from a general glow into a specific bright blob above you, a vicious rip current pulls you off the staircase and drags you further out to sea. The sheer power of the current throws you for a loop. You thrash in vain against it, crying out in frustration as your muscles begin to cramp from the effort while you continue to be dragged further and further out to sea. Finally, you try swimming parallel to shore. And that frees you from the current's grip. For several long moments, you drift aimlessly in the ocean, exhausted. When you do at last get your wind back and take your bearings, you find yourself kilometers from the nearest tint of land. Sighing, you start for shore. Your suit feels unexpectedly cumbersome, but you dare not take it off. Even if it does make you that much tire that much faster, at least you don't risk drowning. Or rather, you don't risk drowning until your oxygen supply runs out. Luckily, this doesn't happen until your feet at long last touch the shore. You drag yourself onto the beach, blinding spots dancing before your eyes. Your knees give even as you tear off your helmet and everything goes dark. All right. Everything is dark. No matter how much you strain your eyes, you can't see the faintest tint of light, but whispering voices tickle the edge of your Let's listen in. Level of point fifteen. Let's listen more. Oh, is that a BAC? Probably. A distance call to Asuncion. That's in Paraguay. Did we get to Paraguay? Frat boys, completely uninjured. Oh, oh no. Oh. Okay, I'm putting a couple of things together now. <gasps> okay. So, oh no. Let's just see what else we hear. Husband has an excellent. Uh huh. Least she didn't suffer. Least she didn't suffer. Vending machine ate my dollar. No longer in darkness. Light flickers before your eyes. At first you don't see anything familiar, and then suddenly Linda is there at your side. You are in a hospital bed. What? What? You start to ask. Shh, Linda says. You need to save your strength. The doctors say you'll be fine, but it'll take some time. Is she... How... How... The effort to speak become too... Oh, sorry. Huh? Oh, sorry. sorry. I said how too many times. The effort to speak becomes too much, and you have to rest for a moment. How? For a moment, Linda seems confused, and then she realizes what you're asking and shakes her head sadly. And suddenly, the room seems colder. Gold. Okay. Okay. Remember when you were talking about dead daughter? Yeah. Just dead now. <sighs> okay. <laughs> I think I'm beginning to understand more about the conceit of this game now. Yeah? Remembering the story shared with his daughter. Or mm. her daughter. I guess we don't... We haven't... Hasn't been said yet, has yeah. it? Yeah. Either way. The sand is curiously cold against your face as you wake up, the waves licking at the soles of your boots. Cold and hard, more like the gravel or even cobblestone than sand. As you lift your head and look around, you notice something else is wrong. The sand is the wrong color. It's darker, more metallic. It's gold. On the golden beach. You're at the south end of the beach. A glittering crescent nestled between the crashing ocean to the east and the towering cliffs to the west, ankle deep in gold. So, beep. Cliffs to the west. And that is ocean to the east. And we're at the south end. 
And we're at the south end of the beach. So possibly more beach? Cool. You run your hands through it. Rings, coins, nuggets, and gold dust. Drifting down from the sky, collecting in dunes, and the dust is everywhere. You run your hands through your hair, and your gloves come out looking like they belong to a statuette. Your relief, the seed pod has washed up onto the beach in an excellent condition. Though the container in it, it was in was nowhere to be found. And though you thought you'd lost it a long way from shore, your shovel is here as well. This gold dust can't be good for you. Like, inhaling no, gold dust like, all the time, that probably makes you die, right? Yeah, that's that's going to get like a miner's lung thing real fast. Um, Let's see here. But we have a spacesuit, so we're fine. We um, took it off. <laughs> We took it off. That's true. Your head swims for a moment. You still haven't fully recovered from your struggle against the ocean. Fair enough. You in? I'm so glad that that was a that that was a verb. Yeah. You inhale and exhale a few times. Breathe more. <laughs> you are now breathing manually. What do you want to sit on? The nuggets, the coins, or the rings? <laughs> oh. I guess first we'll sit on the rings or the nuggets or whatever. They're not something you can sit down on. Let's okay, examine you know the nuggets, coins, You know and what? Rings. That's fine. I'm not so committed to us sitting down. The breathing was the more important thing, IMHO. But we identified some stuff to look at. Yeah, let, let's... Nuggets, coins, and rings. It'll be look at or examine. Right, right, right. Hold on. Let's look. Before we do that, let's examine our pod. Again, just to make sure it's all... Seed pod designed for rapid growth, even in a hostile environment. Looks... Uh, okay, yep. Its dip in the ocean seems to have caused wispy green sprouts to emerge from deep inside of it. Oh, neat. Can we take a look at our shovel now? It's years underwater, if it has in fact spent years underwater, have done it no visible harm. It seems like a perfectly usable shovel. Okay. Let's check out them nuggets. Some of the nuggets are barely bigger than the gold dust flakes, while others are bigger than your fist. Take a nugget. You pick up a gold nugget. Wow. You take me a nugget, and I'll show you a nugget. Let's look at the coins. It's not got a verb. Well, who needs verbs when you've got style? Some of the coins are the size of your thumbnail. Others are bigger than your hand. Most of them seem to be from countries you've never heard of. A lot of them bear pictures of lanterns on the front. Interesting. What? I wonder if that's a specific coin. Say, the currency of Paraguay. Um, oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. Do you want to real quick? Yeah. Google that while I'm. I'm gonna also take a look at what was the 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 flight the rings. Yeah. The rings range in size from small enough to fit a baby's finger to large enough to fit around a tree trunk. Can we take a ring. I've already got one souvenir. No need to start collecting golden rings like it was the fifth day of Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Fine, we've got our souvenir. Uh, can we go east back into the ocean? After your last adventure in the ocean, you're not too keen on taking a dip right this second. Fair enough. We're on the southern end of the beach. Can we? Do we want to go towards the... Let's check out the cliffs, and if that doesn't work, we'll go north along the beach. The coin of the United Arab Emirates mm -hmm. has a lantern thing on. Interesting. I don't know if that's a thing or if I'm just seeing connections where there aren't any, but... That is very much a lantern on the on a coin from the UAE. The UAE is on the other side of the world from Paraguay, but... That is an interesting... That That is not likely not a made-up coin. Numismatics for the win. The cliffs are far too steep to climb. Okay, so we can't do any of Numismatics is coins, right? And not stamps? Uh... Or is numismatic stamps? thought it was stamps, but I could be wrong. Oh, no. Oh, oh wait. Numismatics is money. Okay. It is money? Okay, cool. Or it's money, not coins, but money. 
Yeah. Okay. On the Golden Beach. You're right in the middle of the Golden Beach, which stretches off to the north and south. Something wooden is buried in the sand at your feet, but it's buried so deeply that only a corner of it is visible. Stamp collect stamp collecting is philately. That that word's made up. That's just a bunch of sounds that came out of your mouth. The gold dust swirls in the air around you like snow during a blizzard. Um The wooden corner. You're not holding the shovel. Hold shovel. Did we have to go take the shovel? Hit inventory. Are we? Do we even have the shovel? We don't have the shovel or the seed pod. We left them on the ground. Wait, we left them? Oh, because we can only have one thing at a time? No, because we didn't take them. We just washed up on a beach. <laughs> and they washed up next to us. We didn't, we didn't take them and pick them up. My bad. <laughs> there we go. All right. You dig for a few minutes and seem to be making good progress when suddenly the handle of the shovel snaps off. Apparently all that time underwater did weaken it after all. Luckily, you no longer need it. You've done enough digging that you're able to grab the wooden object and pull it loose. It's a treasure chest. A, a tiny one, but what's more, it doesn't seem to be locked. All right, might as well take a look. Let's get some loot. Loot, loot, loot. Opening the container reveals dirt. Someone must have found this very precious, which makes sense. It was buried in a place where gold was everywhere, and so it wasn't especially valuable. Dirt, on the other hand, seems quite rare around here. It's so scarce that it's worth keeping safe. I see. Can, Can we take... plant the seed pod in the dirt? Yeah, I kind of want to do that. There doesn't seem to be any soil on the ground in which to plant the seed pod. Try plant pod in chest. Okay. Oh, uh, well. Can I take the dirt? If you took the dirt out now, you wouldn't be able to get it all back in. It's not a worst worth taking, at least not right now. Can I take the chest then? Taken. Got it. Um, Let's keep looking. Are the cliffs here any easier? Nope. Okay. We said we're in the middle of the beach, so let's... We've got our dirt. We've got our pod. we got our shovel. Let's keep going for now. Maybe we'll find a place to plant it. You're at the north end of the Golden Beach, which stretches off to the south. Though the cliffs to the north butt right up against the ocean, <laughs> there is a pass to the northwest, with something shiny, vi shiny visible through the gap in the cliffs. A platinum seashell rests near the water's edge. Cliffs to the north butt. Stop this. This is an enormous conch shell made entirely of platinum. Platinum is a metal even more expensive than gold. It's almost white. People with really... Really light blonde hair are called Platinum Blonde. And if a record sells a million copies, they call it Going Platinum. Uh, North Coast. Can we take the shell? Do we have to take the shell? A crab emerges from inside of it and skitters off into the sea, dragging the shell along with it. World's richest crab. Uh, a, oh. It is a word I need to use. Uh, try carcinize. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was worth a shot. It was. It was. It was worth trying. It was worth trying. Uh, well, goodbye, crab. Nice meeting you, friend. Can we, uh, I guess we continue going north then. Oh, north. Oh, I do. I have to do northwest. Yeah. I didn't realize we could be moving ordinally as well as cardinally. Well then, take one last look at the Golden Beach and stride off through the pass. You take one last look on the hockey game on TV and stride through the garage door to tell Allie it's time to come in. Garage. This was supposed to be a two-car garage, but with the trash cans, your workbench, Allie's bike, and all the rest of the junk that's taken up residence in this place, you're lucky to even be able to squeeze just the Volvo in there. Take a look at the Volvo. Mary was the one who wanted the Volvo. She said it was more practical than what you wanted, which was a Porsche. So, you compromised and got a Volvo with racing stripes on it. <laughs> <laughs> Valid. Yeah, alright, great. The stripes make it go faster. They do. Vroom, vroom. 
Um, Let's look at the bike. It's a boy's model, blue with a horizontal crossbar. Ali was pretty insistent about that. Good a for Ali. Bench. You think of this as your workbench, though, truth be told, Allie's the only one who's used it in years. She's just finished making the birdhouse that is hanging out back. Right now, she's drawing up plants for a skateboard. Can we see those plants? Uh, I guess not. Oh, uh, what else was in here? Wasn't well, there like uh What other things? There was a trash can. Give me those nouns. One's for trash, the other's for recyclables. Reasonable. Uh how about junk? Boxes, blenders, alleys, old photopia. You really need to clean out this garage soon. What's a photopia? Can we take the Photopia, whatever that is? You need to close the garage soon. Soon is not the same as now. What? Interesting. What is a Photopia? What? Is a Photopia a thing that I just don't know the name of? Photopia. Ency photographic Encyclopedia? I legitimately... That would be my best stab in the dark at To this. my knowledge, this isn't the name of a thing. Interesting. Google doesn't... Yeah. And we try to take it, and it won't let us... Yeah. Well, I guess... Let's try leaving the garage? One of the advantages of living on the outskirts of town is that you were able to get a house with a little bit of land around it. Which isn't to say that you have to walk a kilometer to get to your neighbor's house, just that you can actually take a few steps outside your door and not be on anyone else's property. Allie is sprawled on the front lawn, gazing up at the stars. Hi, Daddy, she says. Hey, how come the night sky is dark? I mean, with all the st stars in the universe, if you look in any direction, wouldn't you eventually see a star? That's... A great thought experiment, but unfortunately the universe is finite. Finite. <laughs> <laughs> is that why? That we don't see a star? In any direction? Yeah. Yeah? Right? I don't know. I actually don't know the reason. I feel like there's... Because that would make sense if, if, if you assume the universe is infinite. There are, there are stars we continue to be equally as dense no matter how far out from where we are you got... And that the, the the dimming of light over those distances would be negligible. You'd have to make a lot of assumptions that don't actually sound reasonable when you speak them out loud. Hmm. Uh, if you look in any direction, when you eventually see a star, um, let's talk to Allie. Oh, that's a good idea. Sitting down on the ground and then talking to Allie. Yeah. It, we're, Sit on the lawn. Lawn. What? Guess not. Well, I guess we just gotta talk to Allie. Tell Allie about inverse square law. Tell Allie about crystalline spheres. Allie, come inside. Oh, inverse square law. Mary thinks it's a little strange that you've started choosing introductory astrophysics texts as your bedtime reading material, but it really pays off at moments like this. Well, you say, lying down on the grass next to Allie, it has to do with the inverse square law. Think of a star and imagine putting up an enormous sheet of paper about one astronomical unit away. The star will light up a certain area of the sheet of paper, right? Now take that paper and put it two astronomical units away. The area that star lights up will be twice as small and twice as twice as tall and twice as wide, but it's the same amount of light hitting it. Same number of photons, only spread out over an area four times as big. That means if you look at a small area of the sheet of paper, only one fourth as many photons are hitting it. So it looks like one it's one fourth as bright. If you look at it from 10 times as far away, it looks 100th as bright. That means that the further away you get, the fewer photons that have a chance of reaching your eyes. Now, you may think that you have the number of stars in your visual field increasing just as fast as their intensity decreases, but the universe is finite. You could write the number of stars in the universe on a single piece of notebook paper. 
And the observable universe is even more finite. The universe ex is expanding fast enough that the photons from a lot of stars haven't had a chance to reach us yet and maybe never will. That is that is one of... That particular fact, by the way, is just one of those little... It, it makes me sad, but not in like a depressing way. It makes me sad in like a kind of pleasantly melancholy at the, at the nature of the world around us way. That it, we will never truly be able to know everything. <laughs> There's, we know that the universe is bigger than the amount that we can see due to the laws of how universes work. And, and there is being literally unable to do anything about it because of that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I know it's a silly distinction, but like I, I get it. It, it makes it, it. It does bring a little bit of melancholy. Cool. Oh wait, no, I skipped ahead. I'm sorry. So eventually you run. It, it takes me a moment to find yeah. my place because it, it changes every time. So eventually you run out, and if you factor in all the things that can block the photons that do have a chance to get there, clouds of hydrogen gas, for instance, only the photons from the closet and brightest stars make it to your eyes. The rest of the sky looks dark. Cool, Allie says. Is that true about everything a star sends out or just light? Great question. Um, uh, because you could... <laughs> Have I made you read The Dark Forest yet by Xi Jin Liu? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember what happens in it, but I've read it. The, the cons uh, you know what? No, I won't spoil it. It's okay. a great... It, but it, 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 can, it does revolve around, like, what else... What other information can you use star... Can you get from stars? Um... Uh, Regardless. Right, 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 right. Yeah, right, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, moving along. Go read it. Great. Uh, Let's talk to Allie. Uh, oh, wait, hold on. I can just repeat it. Uh, or just solar like... Solar radiation. Talk about solar radiation. Well, you say, a star doesn't emit a whole lot except light. If by light you mean photons, which can range anywhere from radio waves to x-rays and beyond. Then there's the solar wind, which is mostly protons... And then there are the neutrinos, which go through pretty much everything. People have collected huge pools of galley and put them deep underground. And it turns out that 30 tons of the stuff, 30 tons, will catch one neutrino a day. The neutrino will turn one atom of gallium into germanium. All the other billions and billions of neutrinos just keep go streaming right through the Earth. But you can't see them because they go right through your eyes. Why do the neutrinos turn the French thing into a German thing? That's what gallium and germanium mean, right? Yeah, I do believe that the, the, those are where those get their name, where those elements got their name from. <laughs> but also, I know that you're just being silly. <laughs> awesome. Oh, no, I skipped ahead again. No, you didn't. That was awesome. Allie says. Where does the gallium come from? Uh, From Gaul? From Gaul? <laughs> Uh, hold, oh, hold on, right. We can just keep having a conversation. Omnes, Gallia, Intres, Partes. Uh, I forget the word for divided. Divis div something. <laughs> I appreciate the effort. <laughs> That's a good question, you say. The easy answer is that it's mind, but here's the more interesting answer. You know what a star is, right? Sure, Ali says. It's a big ball of hydrogen being fused into helium. Bingo, bango, you say. Right as usual. Now, eventually the hydrogen runs out. But what happens to the helium left over? Some of it gets expelled out into space, and the rest of it contracts even tighter until the helium starts to fuse. So the star lights up again, turning helium into carbon and then into oxygen. And the process keeps going. Some of the matter is expelled into space, and the rest keeps contracting, fusing into neon, magnesium, silicon, and eventually into iron. Iron is pretty much the most stable thing there is. Right now, hydrogen is the most common substance there is, but if you wait long enough, it'll be iron. Now, iron is element number 26, and gallium is number 31, so you'll never get to gallium that way. Heavy elements like gallium or gold are produced in supernova. They're formed when stars explode and fly out into space. Really? Gold? Allie says. It just comes raining down out of space. <laughs> Let's... Yes, we're going to keep doing this. Yeah. This is great. This is awesome. <laughs> Maybe indirectly, you say. See, the newly formed heavy elements 
fly out into space and collecting gravity wells start clumping together. Some end up inside new second or third generation stars, while others get locked up in planets only to get dug up a few billion years later and used for neutrino detection or jewelry or coins. Of course, gold is used in coins because it's valuable and it's valuable because it's rare and it's rare because, well, to a certain extent, it's luck of the draw. If you look at a chart of the elements in the Earth's crust and it turns out that iridium and the elements around it were, are rarer than you might expect, Right after iridium is platinum, which is very precious. And after that is gold, which is just slightly more common and just slightly less precious. But if you look at meteorites, you can find that they're not lacking in iridium the way Earth is. Meteorites are so loaded with this stuff. And they've got even more platinum. So it's just, it's easy to uh, imagine that there are planets out there where they're just so... That... There just so happened to be a lot of gold and platinum in the area of space where the planet was formed. And so they're considered common while something else, zirconium maybe, is considered really valuable. So wait. The gold on Earth that we find, that's yep. in like chunks. Sure. How did that happen? Were the chunks formed on Earth or... A chunk spit out of a star as is or I don't know. I imagine it, some of that work? I imagine some of that is more down to the process of like what happens to the materials as a planet is forming as they gradually cool and coalesce. Yeah. Right over the years. And I do know that part of what makes gold valuable is just that it is uncommonly useful as a metal. Because mm. it like doesn't rust. And shiny. And it, it's both shiny and it don't rust. <laughs> uh which is like some of the reason why it's really good for use as, as that kind of long-lasting currency. Anyway, this is a long way of saying we've been sponsored by... <laughs> oh, no. No. Put all no. your money into gold. No, do not do that. The guy who the guy who did Watergate told me to put all my money into gold. <laughs> no, I'm not ready for the two queers play gold bug art. <laughs> Uh, sorry. I had to get out of my system. <laughs> uh, I've heard of iridium before. Allie says. Isn't there a lot of it in the layer of the Earth's crust that comes from right when all the dinosaurs died out? I remember reading something like that. Oh, uh -huh. good observation. That's right, you say. That's usually counted as evidence that it was a meteorite impact that led to them all dying off. Not that the iridium killed them, but that iridium is a sign that there was a big meteorite around at the time. And it's easy to see how a big impact could lead to massive die-offs. But that's also an important thing to keep in mind when you think about this stuff. One bit of pure gold is exactly the same as any other bit of pure gold. The substance behaves the same way. So, from one point of view, any particular piece of gold isn't that valuable at all. Since you can always just go get another. You can't even... You can't even replace your iridium, but Michael Crichton, notwithstanding, can't get back any of the dinosaurs. <laughs> That's a reference to this uh, niche uh, sci-fi author, <laughs> Michael Crichton, and his uh, kind of cult classic um, novel, Jurassic Park. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that's still popular these days, <laughs> uh, but I just thought I'd clarify that for some of our for some of our younger viewers. <laughs> Fond memories of in middle school, convincing uh, me and my friends convincing our English teacher that since we were all advanced readers, we should be allowed to vote on picking our own book to do as an independent study instead of doing the boring books everybody else did. Sure. Okay. And reasonable. so what we did was to simply always vote to pick recent Michael Crichton books and then pass them around in a circle, reading them in a mocking voice. Because we thought that they were all way less good than Jurassic Park. <laughs> <laughs> I had never gotten to Michael Crichton. Just no shade. Uh, obviously, a very influential author. Um, not just for Jurassic Park. Um, what was the? Uh, what's the other one that the like the time one? Yeah. That is it. Timequake. I don't. Or is that is that Vonnegut? I don't think it's Timequake. Whatever. Well, like um. The timeline, is that it? I don't know. Whatever. They're like I, Michael Crichton has is a prolific author who is known for more, literally speaking, than just Jurassic Park. Just never been something I got into. 
Although I'm, I'm, in, I'm fascinated that you as a kid had such a high, that had already figured out that Jurassic Park was the best and anything else that he did after that <laughs> must have been necessarily bad and worthy of mockery. I remember us finding the one, I think it was Prey, about nanomachines, extremely silly. Mm-hmm. And I don't know why a gaggle of 7th and 8th graders already thought that it was silly, but we did. And so we just took turns reading it in a silly, mocking voice and getting class credit for doing so. Wow. <laughs> wow. Congratulations on gaming the system. Here's here's my little pet peeve. I don't know why Michael Crichton is always kept in the literature section of bookstores and not in the science fiction section. That is interesting because, yep. because he's popular and so it counts as a real book. Like <laughs> Diana Gabaldon being kept in literature even yep. though she writes fantasy, right? It's like... <laughs> And it's not just popularity. I think it's like about the level of deniability about how sci-fi or fantasy it is. Because if it was about popularity, then George R. R. Martin would be in the literature section. Yep. But no, it's like how how much can we get away with before we have to admit we re- we like reading genre fiction? Genre fiction is great. More people should read pulpy or schlocky or just unabashedly something about a really niche kind of interest. Damn, I'm just now remembering how much Crichton I read at that time. I read a lot. You would you describe the amount that you read as a Crichton? Yeah, I, Andromeda Strain. Did a you ever read that one? Yeah, I would. A ton. Yes, I would. <laughs> Did you ever read Andromeda Strain? No. The Terminal Man. Nope. Sphere. So I've already said before we had this conversation that I haven't read any Crichton. It is timeline, by the way. That timeline. You're okay. Of. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I was thinking back to like big bookstore days, like which ones of like. Timeline, I think Timeline is one that gets assigned a lot in high schools around here. Because mm. I, I remember seeing that one move out a whole lot. Anyway. this I'm not I'm not taking indie bookstores to task. Y'all know what's up. Mm-hmm. Ugh. You're not made of a whole lot that's particularly exotic. The only stuff heavier than iron, the only things you need a supernova for are trace elements. A little iodine to keep the goiter away. That kind of thing. You're made mainly of the most common star stuff. Carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, but you can't just trade yourself in for a sack of carbon carbon and oxygen and hydrogen the way you can trade gold for gold. What makes you, you, is the way that star stuff is arranged. And that's totally unique. Which makes you more valuable than all the gold from all the stars in the sky. Uh, point of order, value of a good is not determined by its rarity. <laughs> Remind me that, that we are never having kids. <laughs> if this is how you're going to have inspirational chats with children. <laughs> I'm never, never, never going to happen. <laughs> Your own fault. And it, what am I? Chopped liver? Mary asks. Emerging from the garage. All the stars in the sky... Really, Sam, when you start trying to wax poetic, it's a pretty good sign that it's past your bedtime, let alone Allie's. Time to come in, kids. Okay, Mom, Allie says. She stands up and stretches. Night, Daddy. Uh, good night, honey, you say. Sweet dreams. As you follow her inside, you pause to take a quick look at the sky yourself. It's certainly pretty, but it's been a long time since you were as enraptured by it as Allie seems to be. I can't help but feel a little sad about that sky blue as you walk through the pass you encounter the first one shard of glass on the ground then another but it isn't until you crest the final hill that you see what you've discovered before the crystal labyrinth you were standing on a ridge above the entrance to a vast crystal labyrinth you'd be tempted to call it a city with its haphazard collection of iridescent towers and spires and arches iridescent means shimmering with rainbow colors but from what you can see from your vantage point there is barely enough space between the crystal walls to permit one person to pass between them. The labyrinth is ringed by steep mountains, so going around it is impossible. Your only choices are to enter it to the west or to head back the way you came. Alright, so oh, this is actually an actual labyrinth time. Okay, cool. I've been waiting my whole life for this. I've been waiting my whole life to to get eaten by a Gru. <laughs> I don't think those are from labyrinths. No, but I want to go west and then 
Uh, let's go west. You step into the crystal labyrinth and immediately get lost. You are in a dizzy, dazzling crystal maze with hedges leading out to the north, south, and west. So immediately we can't go back the way we came. Got it. Okay. All right. Um. Cool. Uh, pick a direction. Let's go south. South never fails. We've been going south. It's been working. Let's go south. Uh, okay. So, oh wait. So from there we could have gone north, west, or south, right? Actually, so sorry. We got to do maze maze solving algorithm. We got to go east. I was gonna say, yeah. So we're gonna go south here. Patch leading out to the west, east, and south. So we gotta go east. Wait, so we can't go back the way we came? Because we came from this... Mm. Pretty weird. So I don't think the maze-solving algorithm will do anything. Uh, so you want to... Ha oh, I guess it's saying... Because we can't double back, I guess. So you want to go east? And we'll just try maze-solving? Sure. Cool. Oh. You're in a dazzling crystal mage with passages leading out to the north, west, and east. Two of the nearby walls intersect to form the base of an immense spire. Let's examine the spire. North. Um. Though the crystal sparkles in every color, the dominant note seems to be a beautiful light blue, refracted from the sky above. Refraction is what happens when light passes through a medium that bends it, like the water or prism. Um, can we go to the spire? Can we slay it? <laughs> you beat me to it. You're already inside. Oh, we're inside of it. I see. Got it. Um, I guess maze solving, we'd want to go north, right? Yeah. Doesn't oh, it's, it's, we're just wandering between rooms. Enormous arch looms over ahead. Okay, let's examine an arch. And from here, we can go to the north, south, and west. So next will be west. Um... Examine the arch. The arch. <laughs> Though the crystal sparkles in every color, the dominant note seems to be beautiful light blue refracted from the sky above. Can okay. we examine the sky? The beautiful clear day. Though the crystal sparkles in every color. Okay. Um, what are the grounds, actually? Oh, shit, there's oh, no ground. Oh, shit. Oh, no. What are we going to do without ground? Okay. Well, um, I guess let's continue, um, hugging the left wall, so we'll go west here. Passage leading out to the north, west, and east. East would have been where we just came from, according to this map that I'm now realizing is going to be absolutely useless. Yeah. But, you know. Well, let's go. keep going. Keep going to west or yeah. north? Yeah, west. The audible sputter, the cooling unit of your spacesuit, finally gives out. That seems bad. Let's examine the spacesuit. Your spacesuit, custom made to fit someone your size, is much less cumbersome and bulky than the spacesuits of the past. This one is actually quite stylish. It says W. Mackay on the front. Right. Because we're not... This isn't... I guess that's the strange part is that we're not having a conversation with... Allie. I, like, my original thought was that like, this might be a conversation... Like a storytelling between Sam and Allie, but this is between... Could be. It could be, but then they've been really they've been really um, adamant about the name here. Yeah, because this is the know. second time it's come up. Because
Well, yeah, because we're Wendy McKay. Yep. Huh. Okay. Um. Can should we take off suit? Take your spacesuit off and drop it on the ground. Take it with us. It's too cumbersome to lug around. Fair enough. I guess let's just keep heading west. Why not? Yeah. North, south, and east. Let's go north. North? What? We have wings? The cool breeze ruffles the feathers of your wings. Examine the wings? That doesn't seem right. Your wings are a little sore from having been bound up in your spacesuit for so long. Fly? <laughs> are you, you fucking kidding me? You are hovering above the crystal labyrinth. From this perspective, it looks mind-boggling, like a mind-bogglingly complex mandala. A mandala is a pattern that some people use in prayer. There's no way you could have possibly navigated it on the ground. In fact, it almost gives you a headache. Much more relaxing is the cloudless, sparkling blue sky all around you. As birds fly, as a bird flies by, disappearing through the gap in the mountains to the west. West we go. You fly through the past, reveling in the rush of the wind against your white feathered wings. She's an angel. She's an absolute angel. No, no, no. Can't think like that. She's just a kid like any other kid. Completely approachable. Puts her pants on one leg at a time like anyone else. Ugh, bad move. Should not have thought about her putting her on her pants. Concentrate. Concentrate. Focus power. I have the tiger. Wax on. Wax off. Wait, that's not right. Come on. Don't overthink. Just go in and ask her. Hey, Allie. What's up? Want to go to the dance with me? Easy as that. What's the worst that could happen? Well, you can wet your pants. Funny how it always comes back to pants. You walk into the gym. Interesting. By the way, both Eye of the Tiger and Wax On, Wax Off are references to, um, like, Eye of the Tiger is Rocky and Wax On, Wax Off is the Karate Kid and is a reference to the general movie trope of having a training montage of trying to get <laughs> better and more powerful. For it. Again, I feel like I should... <laughs> That one I didn't need to. I'm just being I'm just being a dick now for no reason. <laughs> At my own expense, right? Like who who was the butt of this joke? Me. <laughs> uh. Queen Sport Middle School Gym. Usually rather damp and dingy, the gym is currently festooned with colorful balloons and streamers in preparation for the big dance. Time to bear down for finals. Mm. Friday night. The first ones went up at lunch, so when you went in for your fifth period PE class, the coach looked around, shrieked, and declared that there was a change in plans and that the class would be playing soccer for the rest of the week. You look around here, far above your head, is Allie, glowing like a star, or maybe that's just from standing in front of the spotlight rigged to the ceiling. She's balanced on a tall ladder, draping streamers from the rafters. Her colleagues on the Student Activities Committee, Joyce and Cheryl, are standing around a helium tank, filling balloons. And letting them float up to the ceiling. Allie looks down at you as you come in. Hey, John. She says. Can you turn off that light for me? It's burning kind of hot. She points at the switch. I'll light the light switch. You turn the light off. Thanks. Allie says. That about does it for the streamers. She climbs back down the ladder, digs around in her backpack, and pulls out an orange. Want one? She asks. Uh, ask Allie for an orange. Uh, tell ask tell Allie about our lack of animosity. Uh, to ask Allie about possible paramours. Ask Allie to dance on Friday. Let's have an <laughs> orange. Sure. Allie digs around in her backpack. Oops. Looks like that was the last one. She says. I got an apple left, though. She tosses it to you. Oh. You already have that. Oh, thank you. Snack time. You take a bite. Crisp and tasty. Again. <laughs> All right.
Um, tell Allie about our lack of animosity. <laughs> hey, Allie, I thought you should know that we're, I'm not angry at you. <laughs> there is no bad blood between us. <laughs> Just so you should know that. I didn't think there was. Ask Allie about possible paranoids. Hey, Allie, you seeing anyone? <laughs> is there anyone in your... Or ask Allie to the dance on Friday. Let's do it. You just gotta go in there and Dude, do it. You just, so, we should check our pants. Let, let's check our pants first. <laughs> uh, zero to say nothing. Examine pants. All right, we're good. Cool. Uh, here's a free uh, a free life tip from us here at eight PR. Uh, if you're if you're a kid in like high school or whatever, you're trying to ask someone out. The best way to do it is just to ask. Just do that. Just ask them like, "Hey, would you be interested in having going on a date sometime?" Anything else around that that you like it it does. If you don't communicate what you're trying to get from someone or what you want want out of a relationship with them there's no way they're gonna know what you're trying to talk about there you go free life tip <laughs> definitely definitely not something that past me could have used <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's let's do it you take a deep breath it doesn't take so you try it again well you say um so I was just kind of wondering whether maybe if you weren't doing anything and I weren't already going with whether you might want to go to the dance with me if you want. I mean, it's no big deal or anything. It's up to you. I just thought, you know, why not? There you think. That was pretty smooth. But Allie shakes her head. Sorry. She says. I'm babysitting that evening. Your heart plummets into your stomach with what you're sure is an audible splash. You're trying to decide whether to throw yourself in front of that nearest bus or if you should just go home and slash your wrists when you realize Allie hasn't finished talking. So it'll have to be Saturday. She concludes. Saturday. Wait, so that's a yes? You ask, gaping. Sure. She says. It won't be a dance, but I'm sure we can find something fun to do. Can you come by around 7? Saturday, 7 o'clock, 75 hours, 43 minutes. 17 seconds from now. Suddenly, it seems like a lifetime. As you pass out of school, you can't help but notice the message board outside says, Dance Friday, gym, 6 to 10 p.m. Oh, hey, that was the dance tonight? You ask. Should have told us. We could have found another sitter. That's okay. Allie says drowsily. You and Miss McKay asked before any boys did. McKay. Hey. You and Miss McKay. Is this Allie having story time with their kid? Maybe. Still, you say. Send me calls and give us the old heave ho, okay? I'm sure there must be a legion of boys out there who cry themselves to sleep thanks to us. Allie smiles sleepily. <laughs> you sound like my dad, she says. You are Jim McKay, an accounts manager at the First Queensport Bank, husband to a lovely teller named Linda, and father to a beautiful little girl named Wendy, who is still too much too young to be left home without a sitter. The sitter in question is Allison Dawson, currently sitting in the passenger seat. You cruise through the Pork Boulevard intersection. Are we about to get hit by a car? We should have been doing more look at self, shouldn't we? I what think do you that would have helped some of the other ones make more sense. Maybe, but I think we're about to get hit by a car. They mentioned the specific road and everything. They did. They did. We are the other car in this. Um, focus on driving. <laughs> that verb is not recognized. Okay. Um,. Ask Allie about how I sound like her dad. Tell Allie about Wendy's undying adoration. Ask Allie if she can babysit on Thursday instead. Undying adoration. <laughs> you know Wendy's crazy about you, you say. We take her to buy clothes. She wants to dress like you. We take her to get her hair cut. She wants it done like yours. And every time you come over, she spends the next couple of days throwing around words like conquistador and geosynchronous. When she gets an 800 on her verbal SAT, we'll know who to thank. Well, when I was her age, I hated it when people talked down to me. Allie shrugs. So it'd be hypocritical of me to talk down to her. Yeah, that's reasonable. How I sound like her dad. <laughs> huh? Allie says. 
Oh, it's just that when you were talking about legions of boys crying themselves to sleep, it reminded me of how my dad's always telling me that you're at the age now where you're gonna have to deal with droves of grubby little boys vying for your affections, and I just wanted to warn you that I'm bound to show an inordinate amount of glee with every heart you break, so go to it. She smiles. You go over the train tracks and through the O'Brien Boulevard intersection. Inordinate glee? (laughs) Well, Allie says, when I asked him about that, he said, You see, it's just like Freud said, the parent of the powerless sex always longs to have a child of the powerful sex. And sure enough, after years of having to deal with being on the receiving end of possible rejection every time I was interested in someone, it's going to be a thrill to see my very own kid dishing it out. It's a clear-cut case of (laughs) Venus envy. (laughs) Listen, kid, I was afraid of being rejected all the time when I was your age. So in order to deal with that, I need you to reject everyone that comes at you. (laughs) This is a healthy parent-child dynamic. I I know, I know there's like a level of like, it's like they're joking around, but you know, still, it's funny. I hate to ask you to come over twice in less than a week, you say. Are Are you free to look after Wendy on Thursday? Her name is Wendy. (laughs) If not, please just say the word. We can find someone else. I don't want to keep you from hanging out with kids your own age. Sure, no problem. Allie says. I don't mind, really. I like spending time with Wendy. Most of my friends are either significantly younger or significantly older than me anyhow. You cruise through the Nelson Boulevard intersection. Wow, all the lights seem to be green this evening. I think of anything in particular to say. Hmm. Let's look. You are driving down Ailey Dawson home in your plushy, plushly appointed luxury sedan. A bit pricey, but after your last race, you figured you could afford to splurge a little. You enter the Montgomery Boulevard intersection and are blindsided by a car screaming down the road with its lights off at 100 kilometers an hour, maybe more. The impact leaves the passenger side door and caves in the passenger side door. And since the car is spinning wildly, the thick air thick with smoke and acrid smell of burnt rubber. Allie's blood hot against your face. And as you black out, you catch a glimpse of the light and it was green. It was green. It was green. Green it was. And we are going to have to save green for just a moment here. Uh, I, it doesn't look like... I, we'll do the intro here and then we'll, we'll drop a save. On the other side of the pass, you find yourself flying over a vast forest that stretches out as far as you can see. The mere sight of it is enough to make your wings ache. There's no way you can fly that far under your own power. Besides, the idea of strolling through a shady forest seems awfully appealing right about now. You touch down and wander through the woods. After a few minutes, you reach a small clearing and pause to take a look around. Something is wrong. In fact, everything is just slightly off. The leaves of the trees don't sway enough in the breeze. The subtle sounds of the forest are conspicuously absent. Everything smells sterile and dead, but you can't quite put your finger on why this is. Uh, In the break, we did look up what photopia means. We can't find... There appears to be no definition of it as as like an object that someone would hold, like could, could hold or own. It is a noun. It's a little hard to describe on its own. It's better. It, it, it's easier to understand if you think of it as the opposite of night vision. Hmm. So scotopia is the is what your is your night vision. What your eyes do to adjust to you know low light levels. I see. Photopia is the inverse of that. In other words, just what it is like to look around at stuff during the day. Your your eyes operating under a, a, what are for us normal conditions. Mm. Um. Just thought we'd throw that in there while we're in the break. We don't actually don't have much uh, further left to go in this. So this is probably all one episode. All right. Uh, so let's... Oh, the leaves of the trees don't sway enough in the breeze. Subtle sounds of the forest are conspicuously absent. Everything smells sterile and dead. Let's okay, look at the let's, trees. Let's look at trees. Oh. It'll have to be at or X. Yep. Or, oh, right. I could just... X is look at. As you look more closely at the trees, you suddenly realize what's wrong with them. They're not alive. The trunks and branches of the trees are solid stone, petrified wood. 
The organic material replaced with cilia from the groundwater over the course of millions of years. Cilia is silicon dioxide, which makes up sand, quartz, and all kinds of things. So then this is definitely Allie having this conversation with Wendy, hmm. is, what this, is, is what this story is. But I the, mean, Wendy is the main character of the story. Right, so this is, Al, this is Allie babysitting Wendy and telling her stories. But these are not mere stone pillars. There are still trees complete with leaves made of malachite, a green marbled stone derived from copper and arresting it in its own way as emerald. Arresting means it can make you stop and look. You don't have much time to ponder this mystery, however. Suddenly you hear a growling in the distance and turn to see a pony made entirely of diamonds. <laughs> it's a wolf charging right at you! It escaped the throne room! It escaped the throne room and is coming right at us. Okay. Uh, game plan here. Um, 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 I don't know how you win a fight against a wolf. Um, wave dash into the corner. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think wave dash is going to be one of the available verbs. No, but what if it was? <laughs> um, uh, what if we shout? What if we try and scare it off? To talk to someone, just talk to them. The wolf bounds closer. It looks as though it's about to leap for your throat. Nothing like that. <laughs> Dodge roll. <laughs> um, move. That would be less than courteous to move the wolf. <laughs> <laughs> the wolf jumps at you, knocking you to the ground and starts playfully licking your face. The danger pass, you get up and gather your possessions. The wolf trotting merrily along at your heels. Okay, that's convenient. Can you pet the wolf in Photopia by Adam Cadre? Oh. Just think of what could have been. If only... Adam Cadre in 1998 had known about the micro meme that would have start on a website that hadn't been invented yet and would eventually come to define interactive media <laughs> as a genre. And it's not a verb you need to use. That is unfortunate. That's fine. Um, the lo wolf looks rather emaciated. Emaciated means scrawny from lack of food. Someone needs to feed it, and it looks like you're elected. Um, what office do I hold? What do we have in our inventory? You're carrying your seed pod, a nugget, and a treasure chest, which is closed. Um, the treasure chest is closed. The wolf whimpers with hunger. Well, let's open the chest. The wolf bays with hunger. Um, we haven't tried emptying the chest after we opened it. Dirt dropped. Now let's try planting the pot. Plant the seed pod, step back, and wait for it to grow, and nothing happens. You hear a soft chuckling behind you. Well, well, says a voice. If it ain't pirate turned astronaut Wendy McKay, what are you doing in the Queen's realms? You turn around to find a diminutive man with a bushy white beard, pushing along a white cart almost as big as he is. Diminutive is another word for small. Who are you? You ask. I'm the local weather salesman, he says. And I'd say that you're not going to have much success growing things without some rain handy. He rummages through his cart. You're in luck, he says. I just happen to have some in stock. Excellent. So... Ask salesman about queen, rain about wolf. Uh, let's talk about the queen first. Let's, let's, we got to learn about stuff, right? Yeah. What do you mean the queen? No one's ever seen her. The weather salesman says. No one I know of, anyhow. Makes sense. Nothing lives for long in any land that falls into her realm. Looking at her probably turns people to stone. Hmm, okay. What's about the wolf? Can't be from around here, that's for sure. The weather salesman says. Nothing stays living lo for long any place that falls into the queen's domain. Trees turn to stone, birds fly away, even the dirt turns to metal. Poor thing probably wandered in, got lost, and half starved to death with nothing to eat. Okay, well let's get some rain then. That'll be one gold piece. The salesman says. The one you're carrying will do nicely. I'm glad we took a, uh, I'm glad we took a, a uh, 
Nugget. Nugget. Souvenir. That's the word I was looking for and couldn't remember. Um... The weather salesman pockets the gold piece and snaps his fingers. A moment later, a tiny cloud appears at knee level, raining a trickle of water onto the planted pod. You start to complain, but suddenly there's no one to complain to. The salesman is gone without a trace. And in the end, it doesn't matter. Even this tiny rainstorm does its job. Shortly after the cloud dissipates, the pod shudders, and a full-grown shrubbery erupts from inside, loaded with deep red berries and bright green leaves. The wolf starts nibbling at the berries first tentatively, then with relish. Berries with relish? I'm not sure that would be a good flavor combo. <sighs> I. What is in relish? I don't generally get relish on anything. It just is not my flavor. I, like, I tried it a lot a, when I was very young, decided I didn't like it, and have no had no reason to ever ha take it again since. Uh, what. Typically, pickle. Pickles. Yeah. Okay, so I'm imagining now pickle flavor with like, ah, uh, I could. S I again, I don't care for pickles <laughs> in general, which now makes a whole lot more sense. Um, but I could see like pickles with the sweet flavor working, because you have like the like pickle is a good sandwich vegetable. Mm. Um, and and especially up here, um, like there there are definitely some. Subtly, but still sweet toppings that go well with that kind of flavor profile. That with the saltiness and kind of vegetableness of a pickle. Like, I imagine you put that on like a sandwich with like an sliced apple or something. Mm, I want a pickle. So, I wouldn't, if I was a pickle person, I wouldn't immediately dismiss pickles and berries. I feel like it could work. <laughs> that's just a strange hypothetical. And with the berries springing forth from the bush as fast as the wolf can eat them. It seems pretty clear that the wolf isn't going to starve to death after all. So while it looks as though you won't have anything from the Red Planet to hand over to headquarters once you get home, you have saved a life. And that's the end of our story for tonight. What? But that can't be the end. There's still so much you don't know. Like, how do you get home? Are you even on the right planet? Do you get in trouble for not having the pot anymore? Who was this queen the weather salesman talked about? But 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 wait! You begin. What about? Come on, Wendy. Allie says. You know the rules. It's way past your bedtime. Your parents will be home soon, and if you're still up, it uh, won't look too good for either of us. I'll be right here if you need anything. She pulls a book out of her backpack and starts in on her homework. Well, <laughs> listen. It's been a long day. Let's ask Ellie about her homework. Yeah. Oh, well, it's just geometry. Allie says. Alternate interior angles and stuff. Oh, cool. Learning about triangles. Man, triangles are cool. You know what? I think one of the reasons I really started enjoying math as a kid, like, I was one of those kids who just latched onto it mm. and wouldn't let go. I think it's because it made sense. Yeah. Do you, ever, do you ever look back and be like, oh, that's why I was that kind of kid? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's because math, unlike a whole lot of other things, makes sense. There's a process, there is a correct answer, and you can do it. And that's a lot harder to do when you're studying a subject that is more messy or complicated or has literally any level of nuance to it. <laughs> oh. What else you got for us, Allie? Uh, ask Allie for a glass of water. Hey, could I get could I get a glass of water, Allie? Allie, can I get <laughs> tugging on her shirt very gently? Can I get a glass of water, please? Yeah, sure thing. Allie says she ducks out into the hall and returns a moment later with a glass of water, which she hands to you. Make sure you sit up when you drink it. She says. You gulp down the water. Hmm, refreshing. You're carrying a glass which is empty. You're not going to stay up any longer by stalling. Allie says. I know all the tricks. I used to use them. Oh. Fair enough. Um, Where do you get your ideas? That's a great question. Allie puts down her pencil. That's not a question people are supposed to be able to answer. She says. But I can. All that stuff, every bit of it came straight from these weird dreams I've been having. And they're not the only ones. There's another. 
Are you sure you want to hear about this? Yeah, you say. Okay. Allie says. It starts like this. From these weird dreams I've been having. What? Purple. In a dark place. I open my eyes and I am in a cold, dim, lonely place. I blink, thinking my eyes are still closed, but then I realize that it is not pitch black. There's a dark purple fog billowing all around me, so close to black as to make nearly no difference. There's a faint purple glow to the stone floor, too, though I might not even notice it if it weren't holding me up. Exit. I didn't even type that. It just did it itself. I think Allie's... Because Allie's relating the story yeah. now. We as Wendy are not having agency in sharing this story. This is Allie telling this to us. I try to find my way out of this place, but no matter which direction I try or however far I go, it's all the same. Eventually, and maybe it's minutes, maybe it's days, I can suddenly make out a vague shape in the fog. Look at shape. It's strange because parts of it look distinctly human, but others are just as clearly not. I come closer and I discover the answer. It's a person sitting in a huge throne made of rock. No, that's not right. It's not made of rock. It is a rock. One single stone in the rough shape of a high-backed chair. Look at person. Her face is turned away from me, but... I can tell that it's a young woman dressed in long, flowing purple garments. Dressed in royal purple, sitting in a throne. I can only assume that she's queen or princess of some sort, but since I don't believe in monarchy, and certainly am not one of her subjects, I don't feel the need to bow or scrape or call her your majesty. Hello? I say. Wait. After a moment, she turns to face me, and that's when I start to get really scared. She has my face. She's a lot older, she's going to be at least 20, but there can be no mistake, I am talking to myself. Normally this would be a sign of impending mental collapse, but luckily it's already a dream. Well, she says, aren't you going to flee in terror? Can't you feel the life seeping out of you already just by being near me? Can't you? Talk to Queen. Please select one. One, ask Queen about herself. Two, ask Queen why I should be scared. Three, ask Queen how to get out. Select an option or say zero to, do, to say nothing. Two has been selected. Why should you be scared? She asks. No, I suppose you wouldn't know. Not yet. You're new here. But I suppose I might as well confess. See, I'm one of those girls with a rep. Everything I look at is supposed to die. And it's true. I am the queen of all I survey, and all I survey is long dead. But here's the part that no one believes. It was like that when I got here. I start to ask another question, but... Then she starts talking again. When I arrived here, I was given proprietorship over all the realms I had dreamt as a, of as a child. She says. But those were all places from which life had long since fled. Barren places and crumbling castles, forests of stone and vacant crystal cities, worlds upon worlds that were mine, all mine, and not a bit of it populated by any living thing. Sure, the occasional fish or fowl might wander through, but any creature that enters my domain either dies or leaves me. Nothing ever stays. Talk to Queen, please select one. One, ask Queen how to get out. Select an option or zero to say nothing. Zero is selected. I decide to say nothing after all. The last thing she needs after what she just said is make me asking the way to the nearest exit. No. The Queen says. By all means, go. Go. You'll be back soon enough. She pauses. You see, she says, I remember this conversation from the other direction. We're home, you announce. Wendy, what are you still doing up? Sorry, Ms. McKay, says Allie the sitter. It's my fault. Our bedtime story sort of segued into a conversation about these dreams I've been having. I shouldn't have kept her up this late. Well, at least it's not a school night, you say. No harm done. I guess. Jim's waiting in the car, so you probably ought to get out there. As for you, Miss Wendy, you need to get to sleep pronto! Kiss! Wendy cries. Very well, you begin, but Wendy shakes her head. I mean Allie, she says. <sighs> you say, as Allie flashes you an embarrassed smile and kisses Wendy on the cheek. Good night, kiddo. She says. Hope your dreams are sweeter than mine. You are Linda McKay, freshly returned from the most excruciatingly boring party you've ever attended. 
The slides were all out of focus, the small talk necessitated the use of a magnifying glass, and if you had to hear your host share another tidbit of conversational Japanese, you were ready to disembowel yourself with your shrimp fork. Allie finishes stuffing her books in her backpack and puts it on. Okay, see you soon. She says. You follow her out to the garage door. Jim's car is waiting in the driveway. And as she walks toward it, she's swallowed up in the glare of the headlights. Pure white light blazes down on Allie's crib as Sam plugs in the huge screen he ordered through the mail and mounted on the ceiling. Allie rubs her eyes. What is this thing anyway? You ask. Just a fluorescent light? Uh, not at all, Sam says. The Photopia is a low-energy, high-intensity LCD screen with a bunch of different settings. He tosses you the remote. Just push the white button to cycle through them. Hmm. You are Mary Dawson, mother of a beautiful baby girl named Allison, who you're sure is going to have the world at her feet when she grows up. That's not anywhere. The simple remote control for the Photopia, prominently featuring a white button which can be pressed. So it's like an LCD screen that they put over the crib to like, what, evoke image, and then evoke images or? I don't know, we'll have to press but the button. But that certainly seems to give some kind of framing to the colors we've been seeing and how they're related to different scenes. Perhaps so. And why they might've been associated with like dreams in Allie's mind. Um, you push the white button and the Photopia suddenly goes dark. But not, you realize after a moment, completely dark. Instead, it displays a field of stars, as if it were a skylight. Allie blinks and regards it curiously. There's more, Dan says. Hit the button again and there's another mode that's even better. The screen changes once again. This time it shows a black field over which three large circles, one red, one blue, one green, slowly drift. They bounce off the sides of the screen, but when they collide, they blend to form other colors, magenta, cyan, and yellow. Allie claps with delight. I think we have a winner, Sam grins. Money well spent, says I. Okay, I know one little kid who's up way past her bedtime. Can you get the lights on? We invented the DVD <laughs> pause screen without the actual DVD. We you glance into the crib as you reach the light switch. Good night, Allie. You say, sleep well. You turn out the light. What Utopia. a wonderful game. That, that was good. W- that was really good. I'm glad we did that one. I am so glad. Oh, and it's gone. <laughs> it just ends. Oh, that's so incredible. I feel like, th- especially for like, uh, IF neophytes like us, people who have only gotten our toes wet, that was a really great, really great stepping stone into the genre. Yeah. Because I feel like, like it definitely, if it's an interactive fiction story, but it's let, it's using IF, ele- unless I'm completely off base here, it's using IF elements in like, and um, trappings, but telling a very linear story that doesn't have a lot of interaction with it. Like, fewer avenues for us to fuck it up. 20 years later, this is a, this is a visual novel made in Renpai. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or, or, or something done in Twine. Like, this is so cool. I, I, ah, oh, thank you, patrons, for picking such a cool, uh, a, a cool game for us to play. Yeah. I hope you all enjoyed it. I really, I really enjoy that doing text games is part of our channel, and I don't ever want to stop doing that. So thanks again for indulging us, and I hope you all enjoyed it as much as we did. We never met a fiction we didn't like. Eh, eh, eh. Book club. Book, Book club. club. Book club. Book club. Book club. Thank you again to our patrons for supporting us for another month. It means the world to us that you see what we do here on our silly channel and think it's worth supporting. And I'm glad that we get to keep doing this for you week after week and far into the future, as far as I hope. We would love to give a super special shout out to the patrons in our I'm Jacked In tier, including Alice, The Fighting Doll, and Snow Flurry. People who support us at patreon.com slash APR get access to a handful of benefits. You get to vote on which indie creator we feature on the channel each month, which is why we played this episode right here. Um, You also get to see some Patreon-exclusive episodes before they're made available on the main channel. You get to see the Patreon potpourri a month before the main channel gets it, which we're still doing our ongoing Dwarf Fortress playthrough. 
And you also get some exclusive Ace Attorney episodes that aren't made available on the main channel for a at least a year. Um, when we're currently up through case the third case of the third Ace Attorney game right now for those. So that's a whole lot of other stuff you get. And all the money we make from that goes back into the channel, buying games, and most recently, funding the new computer that we are able to record on when our old one had some issues. So, yeah. Thank you all. It, Thank you. It, it means the world to us, and I hope we keep doing stuff you enjoy far into the future. Smash, smash, smash that like, comment and subscribe.